we, we tried to lure uh, him here a few years ago uh, more, on a more permanent basis, but uh, he agreed to come back to, to do a, a seminar, which we're, we're, we're grateful for. It's not quite what we were hoping for, but it's, but it, it's, it's we're welcome. Uh, uh, we, we're lucky to have him. So, um, as you know, uh, Bo has been doing um, interesting work on the effects of teachers. Um, uh, so there's a, he has a number of papers on teachers, the effects of teachers on, on one another, um, the effects of teachers on other uh, kinds of outcomes. But today, he's going to be talking about some of his work on the effects of school spending on uh, uh, students' outcomes, which is another you know, critical literature that, that he's made um, landmark contributions to. So uh, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, the, the one other thing I just wanted to mention is we usually run these seminars in what we call econ style. So if you have questions going, going along, um, you should uh, raise your hand and, and jump in. Um, and then I'll, uh, if things get out of control, I'll try to moderate it and, and keep us moving. Um, but I, I think both can handle themselves. So, um, and are we on YouTube today? Oh, yes, good, good reminder. Yeah. So, um, so, two additional things I wanted to mention is if you're speaking, because we're on YouTube, it would be useful, if helpful, if you use the uh, microphones in front of you. So there's a there's a button in the front that if, if you press. Um, a green light will, will turn on on the microphone that will allow you to speak. Not only will we be able to hear you, but the, the YouTube audience will be able to hear you. Um, but the second point about YouTube is, remember, don't say anything that you don't want to uh, uh, have recorded. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, these videos, just so that people can walk watch them asynchronously, we, we, we post them on the website. So anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome both. Oh, thanks so much. So it's, uh, thanks for having me. So uh, so this paper is uh, is joint work with a, uh, a graduate student at Northwestern, Claire Miscavitis. Um, so the title is, What Impacts Can We Expect from School Spending Policy? Evidence from Evaluations in the United States. So by way of introduction, or I should just say yes, so I am very happy to take questions at any point. I've set a timer, and if it goes off, then I'll start speaking super, super fast. Those of you who see me speak know that I can do that, and I will do that if I can do it. Um, but in the meantime, interrupt as you, as you wish. Um, OK, so education, as we all know, is one of the largest single uh, components of government spending in most OECD countries. Um, so it's really important that we understand what the benefits uh, of the spending are. So I think recent evidence really strongly suggests that money matters. Um, I'll talk about that, that research uh, base today. Um, but a lot of decisions that we make as policymakers or in school finance litigation depends not on whether the marginal effect is positive or negative, but how much it matters. What is the actual effect that you're going to get if you increase a budget, the school budgets, by, say, $500 per pupil? What kind of benefits can we expect to see? Policy decisions require that kind of specificity. And I think, in some sense, before doing this work, it was difficult to get a handle on exactly what that was. And if you ask me that question, even though I've written in this literature what the answer to that was, I wouldn't have been able to give you a very clear answer, to be perfectly honest. So on this front, I think there are many unanswered questions. Um, so first, one question is, how much does money matter just on average? In an average sense, in a typical setting, if you increase school budgets by $1,000 per kid, what kind of increases can we expect to see, if at all, in things like test scores or educational attainment? And then beyond that is sort of taking the idea seriously that, well, you know, contexts are different. The effects you're going to see in one setting are not necessarily going to be the same thing that you see in another. So to what extent are uh, effects heterogeneous? And to be clear, what we're going to do in this paper is not ask the question of well, whether these estimates are different. Estimates may be different due to sampling variability. So we're really trying to understand how much are there true differences in the marginal effect that is the effect of school spending on student outcomes across settings. Uh, you know, do, do the effects differ, differ from one context to another? Um, other questions are, a lot of the literature has looked at older uh, 
older policies that happened in say, the 1960s or 1970s when levels of school spending were much lower. You might wonder whether you see you might expect to see similar effects contemporaneously as well. Uh, do we see different effects by spending type, by geography, and by differences in student populations? These are all dimensions of which we're going to test. So there are many dimensions that we're not going to be able to test due to data, lim data limitations, but I think we do provide some new evidence on some of the heterogeneity. And then the other thing is, you know, with this information, we're going to be able to make uh, predictions about the effect of future policies, potentially. So one of the things that I think is nice about the meta-analytic approaches that we're going to use is it allows us to sort of estimate the extent to which estimates vary across settings, and that's going to give us a little bit of, a, of an indication of what kind of effects we can expect in new settings and make basically policy predictions. Um, so we argue that answers to these questions require information that is really difficult to get from a particular setting or a particular study. You really require estimates from a diversity of settings, and I think this is something that is basically well suited to doing some kind of formal meta-analysis where estimates have been, est well, estimates have been provided across a variety of different settings. So what do we do? So we're going to perform a formal meta-analysis um, on a comprehensive set of design-based studies on the effect of school spending on student outcomes. So to be clear, um, when I say comprehensive, I'll describe exactly how we come up with a set of studies. So I'm not saying these are all studies that ex have ever been written, but it's a comprehensive set. Um, and when I say design-based, uh, I'm sort of referring to studies that uh, use some kind of design-based methodology where basically there is a comparison group and there is some kind of treatment group and you, they have done some kind of accounting for potential differences that might exist between those two groups in order to figure out what the effect of school spending may be on others. So we're going to measure the average marginal effects of school spending on two, two outcomes. One is going to be test scores, and the other is going to be educational attainment. Uh, we're going to construct measures of true heterogeneity um, to speak to generalizability, and then we're going to test for average differences across a few key dimensions. And then we'll present a lot of tests. We'll basically present a lot of evidence, uh, showing you that the assumptions underlying our methodology are reasonably satisfied. And it's going to allow us to make some predictions about uh, what we expect to see in the future. So one thing I'll just say at the very, very outset: if anyone here has done meta-analysis, it's a messy, dirty, terrible job. <laughs> um, and there are many, many, many decision points that are there. There's a lot of decision points that have to be made. So. At, and you'll see, so in addition to the fact that like, you have to pour through individual papers that you didn't write, uh, you have to dig out estimates from papers, you have to figure out how to make them comparable to, comparable to each other, and sometimes you have to, well, not sometimes, many, many times, you have to make assumptions about what is going on in one setting versus what may be going on in another. So there's going to be many, many, many decision points, and it's a messy business. So I'm not even going to try and pretend to say I'm going to give you like the absolute right answer. Instead, my approach is to say, look, there are a lot of different things one could have done. There are a lot of different decisions I could have made or we could have made that would have potentially affected outcomes. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, here's what we did. And we're going to show you that our overall top sort of bottom line conclusions are pretty much non-responsive to different choices that we could have made. So any one thing I'm going to show you, like, that's a terrible decision. And it may very well be, but it turns out any other decision that we could have made that may have been less uh, terrible would not change things in any meaningful, appreciable way. So that's going to be the, be, be the approach. So if I present anything where you're like, uh, Bo, that doesn't seem like the optimal strategy, I'm very well, well aware of that. And we're going to basically try and show you that like all, there, all the other things that one could have done that are reasonable are not going to change the bottom line conclusions of the results at all. Yeah. Um, Bo, for the, for the students in the room who are interested in doing work on uh, this type of work, like, will, will this meta-analysis also help them to think about like what research will be the highest margin research, for in a sense, like updating the priors that we would get from this process? Um, I just want to plant that seed, and if it makes more sense to return to that at the end of the, the discussion, I think that that could be something really helpful for the students to think about or to learn from the talk. Yes, yeah, so it's a great question, and it is one that's probably well suited for like we see the everything, but yes, okay. that's a great question. All right, so I'll um, hold it. And it fits in nicely with the general framework of how to think about studies. That's a great question. Okay, so how do we come up with studies? So the data for analysis basically is comprised of 31 studies that estimate the effect of school spending on student outcomes that meet our inclusion criteria. So whenever you do any sort of meta-analysis or systematic review, you should be very upfront about what your inclusion criteria is. Like, what did we decide from the get-go in terms of what papers are going to be included and what papers are not going to be included? 
Um, so in our setting, and included studies had to be based on what we call a valid, uh, sorry, a valid policy instrument, which is to say the, the policy itself had to actually change school spending. The idea here is that there are some policies that may be related to school spending, but don't actually change school spending, spending at all. So if you want to know what the effect of school spending is on outcomes, that's not particularly informative. I'll, give a good example. I'll tell you a good example of this uh, in, a, in a few slides. The other one uh, is that they had to basically, which is I guess related, it had to show that there was a statistically significant, statistically significant change in school spending associated with the policy. Um, there you go. So one thing I should say is that the criteria that we use to include studies right now is that it has to be significant at the 5% level. Um, with a T-stat of 2. However, um, if you're familiar with the econometric literature, there's a conversation about whether you should, when you're doing instrumental variables approaches, whether you should be having a T-stat, sorry, F, your first stage F-stat should be at least 10. Um, some people argue it should be at least 100. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to show you that the results are, are basically the same, even if we look at studies that have F-stat <coughs> which is about as far as we can go before we start losing so much data that you're just looking at one study. Um, so the key outcomes we're going to look at, like I said before, are going to be test scores um, and high school graduation. So, sorry, and educational attainment. So one thing we're going to do, which is, again, based on assumptions, we're going to combine high school graduation and college enrollment into a single binary outcome, which is going to be a measure of educational attainment. So how do we get a comprehensive set of studies? So what we do is, I don't know if, is anyone here familiar with connected papers? So it's this really cool... Uh, as I think I, we did this before ChatGPT was blew up. So, but it's an AI, <laughs> it's an AI based sort of uh, algorithm that you stick in a paper, and then it spits out another set of papers that are connected to that paper. Um, the thing that is nice about this approach is that when you stick in a paper, it doesn't find connect. So, some some place, some approaches to connected papers try to find papers that cite each other. What connected papers does is it does not find papers that cite the paper that you stuck in. It finds papers that cite the papers that you stuck in. So, for example, if you stick in any paper on school spending, um, that is a causal effect of school spending, even if no paper cites that paper, most of those papers are going to cite, based on this, uh, the La Fortune uh, 2016 paper, uh, Hyman's paper, and possibly my paper. So there are a few papers that are basically central to the literature, and if you stick in a paper, it's going to find papers that are connected in that literature. So what we do is we started out with a set of seed papers um, that was actually was born out, it came about from like an overall just sort of like a lip review that I started, and we stuck in every single paper from that lip review into this algorithm, and into the website, and then it spat out a set of connected papers, and then we looked at all the connected papers associated with each one of those papers to see if there's another paper that satisfied our criteria, and if that paper satisfied our criteria, we stuck that paper into the algorithm, and we kept on going until we ended, and basically it stops. The nice thing about using this approach is it ends up basically being like a closed, a closed set. In some sense, if you keep on doing this, you're going to end up exhausting the set of papers that are all connected, that all satisfy your criteria, and this is how we sort of come up with what we call sort of a comprehensive set of papers. Um, one thing I should say is that the database that this is based on uh, does include work that is both published and unpublished, but this is not going to find papers that are sitting in people's drawers or papers that were just posted on someone's private website, it will pick up things that are, say, on like the Annenberg um, Working Paper Series or the NBR Working Paper Series, it will pick those up. But things that are sort of less visible may, may not be included here. So that's something we have to think about. When I show at the end, you're going to worry a little bit about, well, maybe you don't have a representative set of papers. There's some that are missing systematically in ways that might bias your, your results. Um, and we're going to show you some results to speak to that directly. So. Any questions on that? So, so I just want to give you, yeah. I'm oh. oh, sorry, I just want to, is 31 papers that, and maybe you'll get to this, that you ended with, is that like a good number of papers for meta-analysis? That's and like how many question. estimates are you getting from each paper? That's a great question. So, you know, so I've, I've seen meta-analyses that are done on sample sizes as small as like five or six. Um, I think in the ideal for some of the statistical properties to work really well, ideally you want something closer to like 20 or 30. So I think we're kind of in the ballpark where the large sample sort of statistics tend to work. One of the things that we did do in the paper to 
just address the potential problems of having a small number of studies is we do a full-blown Bayesian meta-analysis, which basically is kind of something you do when you have small samples. But generally speaking, I think if you have more than 10, I think you can do something meaningful with it. Um, ideally, you probably want something closer to 20 or 30, which is kind of in the ballpark of where we're at. Um, I will say, you know, when, for, when we look at educational tenure, we have, we have fewer studies that look at that. For, that. for that sample, I think we have about 12 studies. So we're sort of bucking up against an area right on the threshold where you might worry about small sample effects. So for that, we do use the Bayesian approach. We also do some uh, simulation work to make sure our estimates are sort of plausible and within the range of what you expect to see. But it's a good question. Both. Yeah. This is a question for a meta-analysis novice, but this seems like an area in which it should also be possible to, to know, at least at the state level, when there were any sort of useful changes in funding that some, re some ambitious researcher could have studied. So, mm -hmm. like, are there any, is there any way to sort of enter through that side of the house and say, like, are there changes in funding that we think there should be a paper for, and if uh, there's not, we might infer that, like, you know, the, the old joke about, like, the economist passing the $20 bill on the, on the right, ground. Right, right, right. Um, the short answer is I have no <coughs> idea. Um, but, yeah, you're asking an interesting question, which is, like, could you almost backwards engineer papers that you think should exist? Like, maybe there was a really massive school spending intervention that happened in 1985 in Cambridge, and there's no paper on it? Um, that's a good question. I mean, certainly no one has done any analysis like that. We definitely did not do that, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, yeah. I think that would, that, I think that would be certainly a methodological innovation that we've not seen in that analysis thus far, but it's a, it's a good question. I mean, one thing I will say is, I guess what you're kind of describing is, you know, most meta-analyses are done on experimental settings rather than quasi-experimental ones. So even thinking about it in this way is something that it would be relatively new. Um, but it's a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to give you a sense so you understand which papers were included and excluded and understand that, you know, we, we're, we're trying to, you know, to give an idea of the papers that didn't quite make the cut. So here's an example of a well-known paper uh, by Wilbur Vanderklau that looks at the effect of Title I spending or Title I program on, school, on student outcomes. So in this paper, they use, or he uses a regression discontinuity design, looking at data, I think it's from New York. Um, and basically, here is a line from the paper. It says, eligibility does not necessarily lead to a statistically significant increase in average per pupil expenditures. So this is one of those cases where you do the RD, you find no effect on outcomes, but then it turns out you find no effect on spending either. So in this case, they basically, he basically documented uh, some evidence of sort of shifting of resources such that places that didn't get it sort of supplemented the outcome, um, income elsewhere, or so the revenue elsewhere. So that on net, there are very small changes in, in revenue per pupil. So there was basically, in the, in the, to use the parlance of econometrics, there was no first stage. Uh, another example here is a paper by Husted and Kenny. Um, they basically look at the effect of school spending on student outcomes and the way they do it is they think basically run a regression of outcomes and they include year fix effects and state fix effects and then just sort of look at what's left over. So they, to say sort of their preferred, our preferred resource equalization measure equals a change in resource inequality since 1972 relative to the predicted change. Uh, that is the unexplained change in inequality. And then this is a key part here. A fall in this variable reflects either the adoption of state policies that have reduced districts' ability to <coughs> determine how much to spend in their district, or an otherwise unmeasured drop in spending inequality. So basically what they're doing here is they're just looking at the data and using any changes that happen to occur in a state that is not a national uh, change. So in our, from our perspective, we're interested in understanding the effect of specific policies. We want to be able to speak to what the effect of an actual policy that increases spending. So we're focused really on policies. Uh, this is not policy-driven variation, so we don't use it. Um, and the last one is, is a well-known paper by Caroline Hawksby. Uh, you know, in this paper, she does. Uh, so this paper was actually a paper that was designed to look at how differences in the way that school funding formulas are written affects the distribution of spending across state across the state. Uh, 
Um, it was not designed to basically, or the paper was not written mainly to be about the effect of school spending on outcomes. However, at the end of the paper, uh, there is a table where she does uh, look at the effect of school spending on, on high school dropout rates. Um, and this part of the analysis is there's no real first stage F statistic reported, and it's just not the point of the paper. So it was hard to even pull out exactly the parameters that we would need for, to code this up. Yeah. So, Bo, um, so the first paper, it makes sense that you wouldn't include that in your study, because your, your study is like, what's the, ex the effect of school expenditures on student outcomes? But it still might be worth noting if, the, if you saw a number of studies like that, because it, there were public dollars spent. They just right. didn't show up in expenditures per student in school. So presumably, it went to tax, you know, like it was tax a federal dollar. transfer to exactly. local taxpayers. And that's relevant because, like, so for instance, currently, mm -hmm. the federal government has provided like $190 billion in pandemic relief. Yeah. Not all of that is going to translate into increased expenditures mm -hmm. in schools. Some of it is going to show up as tax reductions in, in right. school districts. And so, like, that is part of the, the you know, the, the sort of leaky bucket kind of discussion. Right. I, I realize it's different from mm -hmm. the what's the ex, what's the effect of policies that actually change expenditure yep. per student, but characterizing like how good are we at providing yep. resources that translate into expenditures per student is relevant. Right. right. I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, in this, uh, so I I fully agree with that. I, mean, I think in that. That's exactly the kind of thing where like, I like to quote Caroline's paper on this, which is, you know, she talks a lot about how the design of the formula has implications for what we tend to see in terms of whether you're going to give tax breaks and whether places start, you know, what, what, what are the sort of incentives embedded within the various policies to increase spending? And I think that's exactly right. So exactly. But, you know, my, from, my, from our perspective, that's, the, that's separate from the question of if you actually increase classrooms a dollar spent in the classroom, what happens to kids? But your question is, from a policymaker's perspective, which is exactly right, if I'm going to have a program that's going to raise money on the Title I, if all that money is going to be supplanted and just going to turn into sort of tax relief, then maybe Title I program is not, is not going to be effective. So I would say, and I'm not saying the Title I program is effective or not, I'm just saying, if you believe the results from the Van der Klaus study, one might say, well, maybe putting more money into the Title I program, as is currently configured, may not be super effective because much of it basically gets supplanted elsewhere. Um, but that's not because money doesn't matter per se. But I think, that, I think that's exactly right. From a policymaker's perspective, both matter. Um, so my, I think the way I would say that is, I think it's important to know what happens when money hits the classroom, which is what we're going to speak to. But it also absolutely matters to sort of think through how do we structure the way in which we write policy to ensure that the money actually does hit the classroom? Yeah. Okay, so, oh, oh, oh. Hmm? so should we think about should we think about exercises really saying you know for fifty years the literature was stuck on whether spending more money on schools actually mattered? So in a sense, like the literature started from a place of saying there is a first stage. We see an increase in expenditure, but we see nothing happening for test scores, and it's like, is that really true? And then. And is, is that the motivation for, for this work? And then we could think about Tom's question separately, saying, well, can you even get a first stage? And then maybe there needs to be a meta-analysis about that. And that has to do more with kind of, like, are policymakers effective at designing the right mechanism for even, like, delivering increased school spending? Almost like an extensive margin question versus, like, the, an intensive margin question. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the older literature. Um, but I, I think for the most part, the older literature, at least the way people interpreted it, was what is the marginal effect of spending money like in the classroom? Like if you actually increase money in the classroom, what is happening? Now, I don't know that that literature was, as, was thinking through the distinctions, the subtle distinctions that we're discussing here. It was just sort of like, oh, well, there's these, these things happening, and it doesn't look as though uh, outcomes are improving. I'll just, you, know, you, you sucked me into this, and I'm going to say it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you into something that's distracting. I just wanted to, to make sure that like, we're all like, very clear about like, yes. why you're focusing on this margin and why having the first stage is really important, even though like whether you can get a first stage is a separate and important question. Yes. It's not the focus of this work. That's right. So, so this is just sort of saying the, the older literature, or I should say 
People have looked at the older literature and have made the claim that even if you throw money at school, if, if, even if you increase the spending that happens in the classroom, um, and which is like the money actually goes to the classroom, outcomes do not improve. Now, it turns out that is an incorrect statement. That is, that is based on a basically an, an incorrect reading of the older literature. So it turns out if you look at the older literature, actually, if you code up the numbers in the older literature, the, the average effect, the average margin effect is actually bigger than what I'm going to show you here. Um, and it was based basically on sort of a statistical error by some, some folks. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's kind of what this is speaking to. Like if you increase spending in the classroom, what happens? Which, again, is very separate from the policy question. Well, it's separate from the policy making question of like how do you craft policy? This is saying if you craft policy and it increases dollars in the, in the classroom, what happens? And that's sort of speaking more to the does the money matter literature. That's right. Okay, so this is just showing you uh, what the distribution of uh, years in which the publication took place for papers that sort of made the cut. And you can sort of see uh, most of the literature that sort of makes the cut happened after 2015. So there are some studies that were published uh, a little bit earlier, um, but the vast majority happened in the past sort of, you know, seven or eight years. Part of this just has to do with the fact that in the 1990s, um, it was relatively rare to have the kinds of data that you could do the kinds of things that we do now. You didn't, people didn't have access to microdata to do cool RD type stuff or really fancy diff and diff. If you had two time periods and you did a simple diff, you were already, you were crushing it. So that's just the way it was back then. Um, okay, so this is what the data looked like. Yeah. Sorry, just a, a clarification. So there you were, you were showing these were the dates the papers were published. That is correct. So people shouldn't take that as, as implying these were the years that the policies were undertaken. That is correct. That is so, correct. so there were a number of the policies. Well, some were more recent, but some are, are a lot older. That's right. So it's, it's not necessarily, oh, money matters now, but it, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm gonna, when I show you at the very end, uh, I'll show you the distribution of effects by the baseline spending level which is very strongly correlated with time. Um, and I'll, you'll sort of see what that pattern looks like, but you're exactly right. This is, this is the year of publication. This is not the year um, when the money actually hit the classroom. That's exactly right. Okay, so this is just a summary of the data. So this is just a way to say the data cover, cover multiple estimation strategies. Some of them are IV, some of them are RD, some of them are different diff. Uh, it covers various time periods, like I just sort of mentioned, spanning 1965, uh, is the first sort of policy examined, which was, I think, Title I, the rollout of Title I in 1965. Uh, the most recent one was 2015, which is basically a whole harmless uh, sort of clause in New York, in New York State. Um, it covers populations uh, that are both high income and low income. It covers various geographies, the North, the South, um, and also urban versus um, not urban. So one thing uh, to get a little bit, Peter, to your questions about areas where I think uh, more research will be valuable. There's actually a relative paucity of good uh, research on the effect of school spending in rural areas. A lot of it has been based on, on urban areas. Um, so I think this is one of those areas where I think it would be valuable to have just more data and more research um, to sort of move our priors a little bit. There are probably others, but that's the one that stands out to me. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to do here is, so we're doing a meta-analysis of, yep, uh, just to clarification, are all these studies on the U.S.? Yes. And the other one, uh, when public spending is always at the high school level or maybe also at lower level of education? It's a good question. So it turns out most of the studies are going to be, well, it's going to be both. So it's going to be K through 12, so anywhere between primary, primary and secondary. Um, so most of the test score studies are really going to be looking at elementary schools. The education attainment studies, most of them are going to be looking at high schools. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're doing, when you do a meta-analysis for quasi-experimental for quasi studies, um, it's, it's even messier than a regular meta-analysis um, because uh, it's not a case where you're looking at, say, the effect of a particular drug on some outcome, which is measured in odd ratios, and everyone knows how to measure dosage. There, it's things, people report things in wildly different ways. So we had to make a lot of decisions about how do we compare study A to study B um, in a way that, is, that makes some sense. Uh, and again, it's, nothing, it's not going to be perfect, but I think it, it, it moves the needle. So the first thing is we have to basically construct a, a comparable estimate from each study. So the first thing we do is we standardize outcomes. 
Um, and I know there are, are psychometricians in the room who uh, probably take issue with that, and I, I, I take your point. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Um, so, you know, so yeah, we're going to standardize everything. We're going to standardize test scores, uh, basically by subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. We do the same thing for educational attainment. Um, so this is going to account for differences in testing and reporting, but certainly imperfectly. Um, but it's sort of the best we can do, because in most cases, these tests are just, they're just fundamentally different. Um, so in this case, we are going to, in, in this case, sometimes studies report things not in terms of raw test scores, but they report things in terms of proficiency rates or passing rates. So in this case, where we have to find a way to standardize this, what we do here is we divide by the standard, uh, basically the standard deviation for a binomial variable, which is the square root of p hat divide, uh, times 1 minus p. One thing I should be clear is that's a pretty nasty assumption. So we're going to show you that the results are the same if we just drop those studies and everything's fine. Um, so the other one we do, which is uh, also an assumption, we sort of combine high school, uh, high school graduation, college going, and dropout into a single variable so we have enough observations to actually run the meta-analysis. Otherwise, we'd have to basically we'd have like one study of dropout and two of high school graduation and like you know that kind of thing. So what we do there is basically we turn, again, each one is binary, and we just sub, we basically sub standardize each one based on the uh, prevailing graduation rate, dropout rate, or college growing rate in the state in that year. Okay. So then next thing we do, which is important, is we, only, we basically pull out population average treatment effects. I think someone asked me what estimates we pull, how many estimates we pull from a study. The short answer is mainly we pull one, but sometimes we pull more when we want to explore heterogeneity. So specifically, um, we're not just going to pull out the estimate uh, for the target population or the population with the largest effect. Um, oftentimes, when you look at papers, that is what is emphasized, because sometimes that's what you care about. But that's not really the parameter that's going to be comparable across studies. Um, and then we're going to equalize, when possible, uh, years of exposure. So a lot of these studies uh, present dynamic treatment effects. Where allow, where this allows us to look at the effects, say, in year four, um, rather than, say, looking at the effects for some different year. So we're going to basically equalize years of exposure to be four years. Nick? Yeah, could, could, could you explain uh, a bit more of uh, how you created the single variable from a college going high school and dropout? Yeah, so what we do there, so let me just finish this one and I'll, I'll, I'll jump back to that. Thank you. Um, so then we also equalize the size of the spending change. So in this case, we're basically equalizing dosage. So if one policy uh, changes it by $200, one by 1,000, we basically scale everything by $1,000, so we're getting the same thing. Uh, we basically do CPI adjustments, so we're talking about $2018. Um, and then for each study, we're going to basically get an estimate of the effect of a $1,000 change in per pupil spending sustained over four years. Uh, so to the question of how we combine these things, essentially what we did is we said, look, if you look at the literature, most people are, I think there's a consensus that measuring dropout is very, very notoriously difficult to do. So in most cases, if they report dropout and high school graduation or some other measure, we're, we're not going to use a dropout if we can avoid it. So the only studies that we use dropout for are those where that is the only thing that is reported. Um, so I think there's only two studies that look at dropout, um, but that's, that's the first thing. So if the dropout is reported, so if college going is reported, we take that. If it's not reported, we take high school grad, and that's not reported, we take dropout. And for each of those, we would standardize them by, by their respective standard uh, deviations. Yeah. Do you explore any like nonlinearities specifically in the change in dollar amounts? I'm just thinking about, especially with ESSER relevant, like finding it difficult to spend really large amounts of money, whereas maybe better able to allocate smaller amounts of wealth. Yeah. So we we look we do we do look at that directly. We don't find any evidence of nonlinearities, at least in this setting. So we basically for every policy, we can look at the marginal effect of the policy. And then we can compare the marginal effect. We basically do a scatter plot of the marginal effect against the size of the spending change induced by the policy. And that thing is just flat. Um, now, I don't, talking about the SM money, I have no idea what's going to happen with that because I think that's such, a, such an unusual scenario where you just get a bunch of money that you haven't even really planned for. Um, so I, I don't know how this will apply to that. But that's a, in a separate conversation. Another hand up? Yeah, OK. So this is uh, going to be the main effect. So I just want to highlight to you sort of the, uh, one of these things that sort of jumped out to us as we were coding these studies up 
is how different two studies can seem when you look at the abstract relative to what their actual estimates are. So here's two abstracts. So one of them is a study that was done in Kentucky. Uh, and basically, yeah, they looked at a study in Kentucky and they did a bunch of analyses and they did a, first they did like a difference in difference type analysis, event study type thing. And then their preferred analysis was basically an instrumental variables approach. And in the end, uh, the IV turned out to be uh, imprecise. So it was a positive point estimate, but it was not statistically significant. Um, and then the conclusions here are instrumental variables estimates suggested increased spending induced by Kira did not improve test scores. So that's one of those cases where I would argue someone may have potentially interpreted lack of significance with lack of an effect, but that was the conclusion that was drawn. I would argue potentially due to power, power limitations. The second paper is a paper that looks at the effect of school spending on, uh, on gaps in outcomes. So the focus of the paper is looking on gaps in outcomes, not on the level of outcomes. But to make it comparable to the others, we have to not look at the gaps. We have to make it, we have to look at the levels basically and combine levels overall. So this is a study that found basically large effects for the low income population. Um, and it turns out there's actually slightly negative effects for the high income population. So that when you average the, those two things out, uh, you get something that's sort of not big, but because they focus on gaps, they say the implied effect of school resources on education attainment is large. Also mentioned, this study looks at the effects after I think two years. This one focuses on the year after 10 years. So we're looking at 10 year effect here, two year effect here. But it turns out when we did all the stuff that we do to sort of standardize the effects, um, the effects were almost identical. Um, they were almost identical and actually similar in terms of statistical significance as well. Um, essentially, we're averaging out a, a negative effect with a positive effect. And then over here, we're just focusing on a noisy negative effect. And both of them, it turns out, were very similar. Um, so I point this out mainly to say that, like, you know, I, and this is me just sort of proselytizing a little bit about something that I think in education, we're pretty, education scholars, I think, are pretty good about sort of doing meta analysis. I think in, edu in, in economics, we are hesitantly trying to think about these things. We don't like to do them. But I think there's tremendous value just in terms of just knowledge and understanding literatures to really try to do things systematically and compare like with like. And when you do that, things seem a lot more similar than I think one might have expected. Okay. So another decision point we made uh, was how do you compare increases in capital spending to increase in non-capital spending? So this is tricky because you think of, you think of increases in capital, you're like building a school. So you spend $40 million to build a new school in 2000, and then you can look at outcomes in year 2001, 2002, 2003, all the way through. Now, it would be ridiculous to say, oh, well, $45 million, divide that by, I don't know, 1,000 students, that's $45,000 per kid. I expect test scores to just explode in 2000, and then the following year, it should go back to like what it was before. That makes no sense, right? In essence, you have a building, you enjoy the building for the life of the building, so you have to take that money, and essentially, we're going to amortize that, the $50 million, over the life of the asset, the same way you would if you were sort of doing something in like finance or writing off uh, a building, essentially. So uh, we're going to spread large capital expenses over the life of the asset. New buildings are depreciated at a rate of 4.7%, and non-building projects are depreciated at a rate of 16.5%. These numbers come from some government website about how they deal with accounting, so that's where those numbers came from. Um, and then buildings uh, and basically all, all capital expenses are depreciated so that they have 10% of their value remaining after 50 years for buildings and 15 years for non-building capital um, construction, respectively. So here are basically the sort of the, the time depreciated value annually for two different studies. So the first one on the top is basically Nielsen and, Nielsen and Zimmerman. So this is one that basically uh, there was a $45 million project per school. Most of these were, were just new school construction. So if you take $45 million per school, typical school has about 650 kids, and then you spread that over the 50 years life of the asset, this corresponds to about $2,500 for the first four years of the life of the asset. So in this case, we'll take $2,500 as the increase in school spending associated with this $45 million building project. The other one here, which is much smaller, uh, was basically a project by Martorell et al. And this is a, these were increases that were just sort of building upkeep. Now again, if you look at the dollar amount, it's like a million dollars per school. So increasing per people spending, at least in that year, by you know, 
thousands of dollars. But when you spread this over the 15 year life of the asset, this works out to be about $90 per pupil uh, per, in terms of the, for the first four years. One thing I'll sort of point out to you here is that $90 per pupil, when you think about it from that perspective, is actually pretty small. And most of the studies that look at the effect of capital expenditure do, simply do not have the statistical power to detect effects of a $90 uh, increase in school spending. They do have the power to detect increases of $2,500, but not $90. And it turns out a lot of capital studies look like that, and very few of them look like this. So I'm sort of previewing some of the results, which is to say that like, the conclusion that sometimes people have drawn when they look at the new literature is that, oh, many of the capital studies don't find statistically significant effects. I'm arguing that I think that's basically an artifact of lack of statistical power, not lack of an effect per se. Okay. So these are event study plots from the nine studies that we have that look at capital. This, uh, the one at the very top over here, this orange one, this is, the, uh, this is the paper, this is the Nielsen paper that had a very large effect. This sort of blue, uh, blue dot over here is the Martorell one. So you can see just the bigger effects for the ones that had larger changes. So that's already telling you that probably there's something there. And this over here is just the weighted average of all these effects. So this is just saying relative to the time of a large increase in capital spending, what happens to test scores? And you can see when you look at the weighted average, it tends to, it tends to trend up. Basically, it tends to be flat for the first two years. It takes about two years to build a building. So we're going to take the year six effect as comparable to our year four effect. So that's how we're going to make capital and non-capital comparable. Okay. So how do we do this um, in terms of the method? So the random effects meta-analysis meta looks like this. So the key, key thing to sort of highlight is that this is not going to be a scenario where we're just going to take an average of the effects and say, OK, there's a bunch of effects. We're just taking the average. Instead, we're saying, look, each estimate that we observe comes from its own average. And there is real heterogeneity out there. And we're going to try and measure the heterogeneity that exists in the real world. And that's going to be valuable for making policy predictions. So we have the actual estimate from, say, study j, which is going to be theta hat j. And we're going to say this, has, this follows a normal distribution centered around the true effect for study j. So there's a study that looks at increases in school spending in Texas. We have an estimate from that study. But that estimate is not basically the true effect. That's basically the true effect plus some, some noise. And this should have a comma down here instead of a plus sign. Apologies for that. And that basically has variance sigma squared j. And sigma squared j is going to be the within study sampling variance. Then the second part is the true effect for study j also is going to follow a normal distribution centered around the grand mean theta with variance tau squared, which is to say there's a true overall grand mean, which is theta, but not every study is estimating that same thing theta. The, uh, each estimate basically is an, is, has its own mean, um, and we are getting an estimate of that. So what that means is deviations from the grand mean happen for two reasons. One of them is sampling variability, but the other is true heterogeneity. So the distribution basically of estimates follows a normal distribution, which is centered around the grand mean, and it has these two sources of error. And I think what happens is sometimes people in the old school meta-analysis, people haven't estimated tau squared. But basically, the new school meta-analysis, which has been around for like 10 years, we do estimate these things. So, okay. so we sort of know that if we know that that is a distribution of effects, then the optimal precision weighted average is going to be time to speed up. Uh, so the optimal precision weighted average is going to be this guy, where each study is basically in, weighted inversely towards precision. And that's going to be our estimate of the pooled average. So the question may be, OK, well, what we're going to do is how do you, so first of all, you might say, how do you estimate tau? How do we observe tau? The way we estimate tau um, is by looking at the variability across studies that cannot be explained by sampling variability alone. So just to give you a visual representation of how this would work, um, here's an example of two studies, study A and study B, and their respective, say, 95% confidence intervals. You can see the confidence intervals clearly overlap considerably. So this is consistent with these two studies essentially coming from the same distribution. And you'd, you'd infer from this, well, maybe there's not much heterogeneity. This over here is another scenario where we have two studies, study A and study B. Their confidence intervals do not overlap. And you would say, well, it looks as though there's some evidence of some heterogeneity, 
Now, I'm not saying these, you, the estimate is not directly just the bounds of this thing, but you'd say, well, this is consistent with there being some heterogeneity, and it's inconsistent with each of these study estimates being random draws from the same distribution. So basically, what the model does is it model, it basically comes up with, yeah, it models exactly how much of the variability can be explained by sampling variability alone using the estimated standard errors from the studies, and then it figures out what tau must be. And that's how it constructs the weighted average. Is that? Okay. Yeah. So. No worries. Uh, so, um, so you're not saying anything at this point about what the source of the heterogeneity. That is correct. So it's not that the same intervention has different effects on different populations, or, or um, you're just saying, okay, there is some source of heterogeneity. It may or may not have something to do with the variety in the kinds of interventions people use exactly. this money to buy, nor is it variation in the effect of the same kind of intervention across populations. It's some probably some combination That's right. of both. That's, That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So in the first step is to be pretty just completely agnostic about it. Look, we don't know how much heterogeneity there is. Now we want to once we estimate heterogeneity, then we also of course we want to explain it. Um, but even knowing how big it is is important because if heterogeneity is really big, then it tells us that like in some other setting, we can get things that are really, really big and negative or really, really big and positive, and maybe anything is possible. Also, however, if you estimate that heterogeneity tends to be really small, then it's saying, well, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're always going to get something within a very, relatively narrow range. So I think there's, so there is definitely policy content to the heterogeneity estimate, even if we don't know exactly what it is because it gives us a sense of, it allows us to bound the kinds of set of estimates that we, or the set of true effects we, we want to see. But at this point, you're exactly right. The, where I'm not saying anything about what the source of that heterogeneity is. It's just sort of estimating how big it is. OK. So we're going to use a random effects uh, meta-analysis. We're going to get a pooled average, which is that precision weighted average. We're going, get, we're going to get a standard error for the pooled average. And then we're going to get an estimate of heterogeneity tau squared. And we're going to report, basically, two intervals. The first is going to be the standard confidence interval. This is going to be the range of values that we're confident uh, include the true pooled average. And then we're going to report uh, basically a prediction interval, which is going to be a range of values that we're relatively confident is going to basically include a future estimate. It's kind of a range of values that we expect to see in the real world um, if we were to have a policy that increased spending by $1,000 for four years in some other setting. And the question is, is this prediction interval really, really big, or is it really, really narrow? And I would argue this thing is what's relevant for policy, but we've been having long conversations about this. And this is not relevant for policy, whereas that is. Okay. So one thing that's sort of interesting is uh, you can use this method to do what's called empirical Bayes estimates for individual studies. For those of you who are doing like teacher value added, or principal value added, or school value added, um, you have an estimate of, say, the principal of the school. You know that it's noisy. And then you say, well, I know that this thing is noisy, so I'm going to do a shrinkage estimator of this thing to make it more reliable. And you can, you can come up with a prediction of your best, you can come up with a best prediction of the effect based on the estimates. So you can do the same thing here. So the random, it basically allows you to compute, this, this approach allows you to compute empirical based estimates of the effects of individual studies. Um, and the logic is analogous to shrinkage estimates for teachers or schools. And essentially, noisy estimates are going to be shrunk towards the grand mean, yielding uh, the best linear unbiased prediction of the effect in an individual study. What that means is when you have a study, not only do you have the effect of the study, but you can use this approach to say, based on the existing literature, what can I say about the likely estimate or the, li the, sorry, the likely effect in that study's context? I'm going to show you some examples of that. Um, so what it looks like is basically the empirical Bayes estimate, the best prediction of the true effects in context J based on the effects or the estimate in context J and everything that we know about other studies is just a weighted average of the pooled estimate and the actual estimate itself, where noisy estimates are, have a smaller weight on the actual estimate itself and higher weight on the pooled average. Okay. So this is what the distribution of effects looks like for test scores. 
right now these are showing effects overall and also for low income and high income populations all in one plot. So the red, this sort of pink area here is the 90% uh, confidence interval for the pooled average. Basically this lies squarely above, above zero. We can just rule out that the effect is zero on average. But it doesn't mean that the truth, it doesn't mean that the effects are gonna be positive all the time. It just means that the pooled average is clearly above zero. Um, this is a 90% prediction interval, which is to say, even though we see estimates that are really, really wide, the prediction interval is actually relatively narrow. What's going on here is we have studies like Roy, which has a very big effect of 0.38 standard deviations. But essentially what the model is saying is, no man, that's not a real effect of 0.38 standard deviations. If you increase spending by $1,000, test scores are not gonna go up by 38% of a standard deviation. What's really happening is you just have a really noisy estimate. It's just a big estimate that has a really wide confidence interval. So the most likely interpretation is that, well, this is just a really noisy estimate and the empirical base estimate is 0.038. It's about 10 times smaller than the actual effect. So I think there's a lot of value to even just thinking through uh, what the estimations are, error, errors are in these studies and what the implications are for how we interpret those estimates. Um, and this kind of comes back to like, you know, when people present papers sometimes in seminars, you sort of see that someone puts up a number and it's big and someone says, well, that number is way too big to be, to be believed. And I think the answer is, one in response to that is yes, it probably is too big to be believed, but if you sort of use a Bayesian uh, approach to think about it, chances are it's just a noisy estimate that is much smaller. Um, so yeah, if it was more precise, it would get a better, it would basically be uh, closer to the middle. And you sort of see here, something that looks very much like what you expect to see with a random sampling of studies. The estimates that are in the middle are pretty precise. The estimates that are really, really big are really imprecise. The estimates that are really, really big and negative are really imprecise. And you can see here, uh, this is not something that necessarily has to be the case, but you can sort of see that the prediction interval basically crosses over the 90% confidence interval for most, for, I think for all of these estimates. It's just kind of the range of, of the range of estimates that we think the true effects lie. Yeah. So Bo, I, I think this fact that you're pointing to is part of the reason why there was the old literature, people concluded money didn't matter because the magnitude of effects that people were looking for were absurdly large. You know, so like, I, I think people, it's only in the last 10 years or so that people have appreciated that like, you know, if the typical gain from sixth to seventh grade is 0.3 of a standard deviation, it would be ridiculous to think that by spending a thousand dollars more mm -hmm. per student, you'd get anywhere close to that. Like, so I think it's, people have become more sensitive. So 0.38 is ridiculous. Right. Um, but I think that was the magnitude of effect that I think people had in their mind that they were sort of looking for using the old Jacob Cohen um, you know, characterization of, of what was a big effect or a small effect. I, I might beg to disagree on that, but fair enough. I take, I take your point. Um, yeah, but I mean, these are not huge effects. Um, to be clear, these are not huge effects. And, you know, like I said, if you did the old studies, um, Hanish, well, so Hanishik didn't actually estimate the average in his, in his work, but other people did go back and they found effects, I think about twice as large as this, um, that were positive and twice as large and also not, and were also clearly statistically significantly larger than zero. Um, but maybe he just thought 7% was small or people thought that was small. That's fair, that's possible. All right. Um, okay, so here are a few other uh, estimates here. I'll just go over this quickly in the interest of time. So this is the average, pooled average effect for test scores. It's point, uh, 0 0.0316. So increasing school spending by $1,000, um, it basically on average increases test scores by about 3.16% of a standard deviation. And you can see here the estimate of tau is about 2% of a standard deviation. So this is sort of, if you sort of think about this, it's sort of telling you that on average, we would, ex or, uh, in general, we'd expect to see positive effects about 90% of the time. And in fact, the 80% confidence interval lies well above zero, but the 90% confidence interval actually crosses zero, which is to say, we actually expect to have non-positive non effects, you know, more, about 5%, at least 5% of the time. It's not gonna be always a guarantee. Um, you also see that there's an upper bound here. 6% up here, the 95% confidence interval, the upper end, end of that is 7.4%, which is to say 
getting getting test score effects with a of like one like ten percent of a standard deviation would be a really big effect for a thousand dollars based on the set of studies that we have here. Um, I think that's really important because you know sometimes people look at the distribution of studies and they say, oh, these studies are all over the place. Yeah, they are all over the place because they're estimated with noise. But it turns out for the most part, most of them really lie in this range and estimates as large as, I'm not trying to pick on this study, but as large as this one that is like 0.38 is basically would never happen based on the estimates that we have here. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you reject that this estimate is there. So you have positive effects about 90% of the time and the prediction interval is pretty small. So this is showing you the same thing for educational attainment. Here, you do see uh, that you have some positive, again, some really large but imprecise effects over here. Again, those are ones that I would sort of downweight. Um, and things get more precise as they get, to, get uh, to be smaller. One thing I will highlight here, which would be sort of cause for alarm potentially, is that you don't really see, unlike test scores where you saw some negative effects that were imprecise, you don't really see any evidence of that here. One interpretation of that um, is potentially that there's some selection, there's some publication bias. Editors or whatever don't want to publish imprecise estimates that are negative and large. Mainly because they're like, well, if it's negative and large, that goes against my priors. And it doesn't really make good theoretical sense that you should have a really large negative number from giving money. And if it's imprecise, it's basically inconclusive anyway. So like, I could see why people wouldn't publish it. And this is, this, the evidence, the, the distribution of estimates is sort of consistent with that potential interpretation of the results. Now, to be clear, it's also possible that maybe there just are no negative effects of this kind. But if you're worried about uh, publication bias, uh, you might worry a little bit about this in the case of education attainment. I'll show you basically that this doesn't really impact the results very much. Uh, the, the, the basic reason for that is that when we're doing a precision weighting approach, uh, you're already focusing pretty much on the studies that are right in the middle, which are the ones that are less likely to be susceptible to bias anyway. We're not really putting heavy weight on these big studies estimates over here. So even if you did have some studies over here, it doesn't change the precision weighted average very much. Okay, so <clears throat> you'll notice that, yeah, so the, raw, the distribution of raw estimates is very, very wide. And basically, the 95% confidence interval is narrow. So if you look at the numbers here, I'll interpret this. You can get a coefficient of 0 0.0574 on standardized education attainment, which is a meaningless number. What this basically is saying is that for high school graduation, increasing uh, school spending by $1,000 would raise high school graduation by about 2.05 percentage points. Um, and increase college going by about 2.81 percentage points. In this case, you can see tau is 0.02, similar to that of test scores, but the point estimate is larger. So in this case, you can see that both the 90 and the 95 percent confidence intervals uh, do not overlap with zero. The 99 percent confidence interval does. So most, the vast majority of studies, it would, it would appear, are going to have positive effects for, on educational attainment. So uh, how do we make predictions for the model? So one of the nice things about this is that if you're willing to, uh, to buy the normality assumption and we have estimates of tau, this allows us to actually come up with a prediction of what the effect you might expect in other settings. So to make policy predictions, uh, we rely on the assumption that these estimates are normally distributed, that the, the true theta j's are normally distributed around sigma, sorry, around the overall theta with variance equal to tau squared. Now we don't observe capital theta, but we have an estimate of it. So you can say, well, the true effects are going to be normally distributed around the precision weighted average with variability sigma squared, uh, tau squared plus sigma squared, or s squared. All right. So if normality holds, uh, then we can make these predictions. But you may worry that normality doesn't hold. So one of the things I want to do very, very quickly is to show you some tests that normality does hold in our data. So the first is there are tests that you can use. Um, one is a test by Wang and Lee, which basically develop uh, a normality test when you have estimates by basically constructing kind of like a shrinkage type estimate and then applying the standard shapiro wilk test of normality to it. When we do that with our estimates, both for test scores and educational attainment, we uh, do not reject that the estimates are normally distributed, telling us that we could probably use a normality assumptions to make predictions. The other thing that we do is we do something called deconvolution, uh, which is a method that I learned about in the process of writing this paper, which is, well, we don't observe the true distribution of effects. 
So if you just drew like if you just put up a kernel density plot or a histogram of the estimates, that thing is not right. That thing is over dispersed, and the shape of that thing is not necessarily the shape of the true effects. So what you can do instead is you uh, say, well, we have the estimates here. We know that the estimates are normally distributed around the true effects. We know that's true by the central limit theorem. And then we know that the true effects have some distribution of shape G. And we don't know what G is. So what you can do, and there are various ways of doing this, is to say, well, I can take the estimates, and then I can basically fit a Fourier transform. Uh, I don't know if you remember going way back to like you know linear algebra, uh, to the data to figure out what the shape of this distribution G is. And accounting for the fact that we know this is noisy, and this tends to work pretty well at uncovering the true dis the distribution of true effects, netting out the estimation errors. And when we do that, and again, this is basically because we're using a free or transform, it can take any shape. And the question is, does that shape that we get look very, very different from a normal distribution? It turns out it doesn't. So I'll just skip over that and say it doesn't. So it's a fine. So normality holds. So let's make some policy predictions. So you can sort of, I've already sort of talked about this, but overall, this is saying you expect, on average, positive test score effects about 92% of the time. Uh, effects above 0.03 about half the time. 3% of a standard deviation about half the time. And impacts above 5% of a standard deviation 20% of the time. And you'd almost never see effects larger than 8% of a standard deviation. Now, if you think 8% of a standard deviation is small, then that's basically telling you that's kind of what, that's where we're at. That's the kind of effect size that you'd expect. And it's relatively rare to see effect sizes of this size. And to be clear, there are many papers that report effect sizes of this size and larger. Our interpretation is that these are just noisy estimates. Doing the same thing for educational attainment. We would get positive effects about 97% of the time. And to be clear, positive just means like it could be very, very small and positive. Yep. Um, just to clarify, so these are all based off of if if there's like the $1,000 increase in per yes. pupil expenditures? Yes. Like do we have, and I'm just not familiar with the literature, like is that is that number, like should we expect it to increase linearly if as you double or whatever that like how do you think through that so within the range of the estimates that we have we find that it's flat like the mar the marginal effect does not differ depending on whether the spending change was like a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars we, we it's rare to see changes uh that are really really big most changes tend to be in the 500 uh around the 500 hundred dollar range uh some are in the thousand but like that's kind of the range we're talking about um but so certainly uh, I would not look at this and say I expect a $4,000 increase to be four times this. I think that's probably that's definitely going outside the range of the data um, and probably extrapolation that wouldn't work super well. Okay. Yeah, I think I was just confused because we were, you were talking about amortizing the capital expenditures, and those are like many millions of dollars over a smaller right. number of students. So how does that pair with like these $1,000 per pupil expenditure? So for the capital, what we do, what we do there is we take, we take a $45 million capital expenditure, and we basically say, look, it's $45 million. There are, say, 1,000 kids in the school. So we divide 45 million by 1,000. And that's the per dollar amount per kid, which is, I don't know, 45,000 or something like that. And then we say, OK, well, $45,000, but you're not experiencing that in year one only. You're experiencing it over 50 years. So you, I mean, you don't divide by 50, but you spread that over 50 years. And then you end up with a number that's closer to $2,500. All right. So then a policy that increases, yeah, so in terms of educational attainment, uh, on average, we get increases in high school completion about 2.5 percentage points, college going about 3.5 percentage points, about 30% of the time. And then you can see on the upper end, uh, you know, that same policy, whoops. Yeah, so on the upper end, we expect increases about 3.2% for high school completion and 4.5% for college going about over 10% of the time. So I think these are reasonable estimates of what you might expect. They're not massive, but they're not small. So what explains the heterogeneity? So like, what, what, what explains this? So you all have sort of asked a few of these things. So the first thing is what we can do. We basically estimate random effects meta regression, and we have the estimates, and we can see whether the estimates vary by things that we can observe about the study context. Um, so we look by capital versus non-capital. It turns out we don't really find any evidence of that. Um, we look by student population served. Um, income level, we do find some evidence of that. I'll talk about that in a second. We look by geography, we don't see any evidence of that. So I'll just focus on the uh, income level. So this is basically just showing you the same uh, predicted uh, policy effects 
for the low income population over here and the non low income population over here. The difference between these two distributions is statistically significant and you can see that the uh, you're more likely to see larger effects for the low income population than the not low income population. So very realistically what this is sort of telling you that you expect positive effects for the for the basically the more affluent population not 100% of the time but closer to sort of like 75% of the time, 80% of the time. So for affluent populations, increases in school spending do, are not necessarily going to increase outcomes all the time, but you're still getting it about 75% of the time. For the higher income population, sorry, for the low income populations, the estimates are much larger. So 70%, so for non-low income populations, it's about 70% compared to 90% for the high and low income. Effects of like 4% of a standard deviation on test scores, uh, you would see that only 13% of the time. Uh, yeah, for the low, for the high, for the high income population, and then impacts above six percent of a standard deviation, you almost never see. The effects on education attainment are much more pronounced by income. So for this one, you sort of see on average a thousand dollar, so a thousand dollar increase for four years is going to increase increase education attainment for low income populations ninety nine percent of the time, compared to eighty percent of the time for the higher income populations. This would basically, such a policy would increase college going by two percentage points for the low income population over 90% of the time compared to under 30% of the time for the higher income population. So here you're seeing a quite a large difference that is consistent with the idea that like it's, it's going to matter a lot depending on the student populations that you serve um, where you're going to get pretty large effects for the low income populations and much more modest effects for the not low income populations. And then large effects above five percentage points would happen about a fifth of the time for low-income populations, but we basically never see that for the high-income populations. So, but is it is it right to infer from these results that if there's a ton of inequality in in school expenditures, that in a sense, if you just look at naive correlations between school spending and educational outcomes, you could actually get a situation in which like the overall estimates are in a sense kind of like biased towards zero. For sure, that's. I don't know if my estimates are saying that, but for sure, that's the case. Okay. Yes. So this gets at I think uh, your question earlier about timing. So this is looking at whether school spending effects have been diminishing over time. So one of the big critiques people have made is, well, maybe fine. Maybe I believe Jackson twenty fifth Jackson and Persico and and Johnson twenty fifteen, uh, but that was like nineteen seventy two. That's a long time ago. We're now in 2023, we don't think that's gonna, that's gonna be relevant anymore. Maybe. So let's look at the data and see what happens. So what we did there, we basically said, let's look at all the studies and let's plot the uh, marginal effect against the baseline spending level that was prevalent in the year that the policy was, was implemented. So this is not exactly by time, but it's pretty closely related to that. But you can look at individual studies if you're interested. So you can see here, the biggest, one of the larger effects here, that had basically the largest uh, baseline spending is actually above the average. So this is a Gigliotti and Soros paper, which is a 2015 paper in New York. Um, it's pretty big. And then this is pretty similar to sort of, you can't really see it, so test score effects. But well, most test score effects are relatively recent. But PAPK, I think this is sort of in the 90s. So we have a study in the 90s here, which, you know, it is slightly bigger than the effect in 2000, uh, I forget exactly when this was done, 2015 but not appreciably so. The only study that has a really big effect, again, is this one up here, but the size of the circle tells you how precise it is, and this is the one that was really imprecise. So if you estimated this thing without accounting for precision, you might naively think, oh yeah, clearly there's a downward sloping thing, but once you account for precision, it, it's not. Over here, when you look at uh, education attainment, again, so we see a big effect here associated with Caskio, Gordon, and Reber. Um, this is uh, Rucker Johnson's paper looking at Title I, and this is more recently Lee Palachek, which I think was done also in around 20, 2010. So again, there's this relatively little information. And this over here is Jackson, Johnson, and Persico. So Jackson, Johnson, and Persico looking at 1965, sorry, 1972 and onward, 2012, these effects cannot be distinguished from each other. So there's just relatively little, little evidence that timing or baseline spending levels are affecting the marginal effect in any appreciable way. Yeah. So both, if you converted both test scores and educational attainment into estimated impacts on career earnings, yeah. like could you put these two distributions together? Like, like so, you know, it, it, I, I re realize it 
requires more heroic assumptions there. But, like, but right. if you could say, okay, what's our best estimate of, of the high school grad, non-high school grad, college yeah. grad, non-high school grad, put that into dollars and then did the same thing with test scores using like the Neil and Johnson or other mm -hmm. estimates and just say, like, are, are they in the same ballpark or not? To see these. So, so what I have done, which I think you already know, uh, to speak a little bit to like, are these estimates in the same ballpark? Um, well, let me, let me back up. Are you asking whether the test score effects are in the same ballpark as the education? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So what we did in that, we said, well, it, it, to figure that out, the best thing we could do in the idea, what you'd want is to have some setting where you had random assignment that changed both educational attainment and test scores, and you can look at the effect on wages in the ideal, right? And then we could just use these two relatively clean experimental estimates and back stuff out. The closest we came to that was using Project STAR, where Project STAR had estimated effects of small classes on test scores and the effects of small classes on educational attainment. And then we can say, OK, well, how do these effects relate to sort of reduction in class size? And basically, the test score effects correspond to a reduction of about one kid. The educational attainment effects correspond to the effects of about seven kids. Now, we do the same thing using estimates of the effects of teacher quality using some of the Ch Chetty's old studies. So you might, so, and same thing, we find the marginal effects are much bigger. Uh, so I say that the implied effects are much bigger for the educational attainment stuff than the test score stuff. Now you might ask why. Um, one interpretation is that test scores just don't measure everything. Not that they don't measure anything, but there's a lot that test scores don't measure and that's our interpretation. Um, but I think there's probably uh, a lot of things that you can worry about how what we're measuring with changes in test scores um, such that you know there's, that, that's just one potential explanation but if we when we do the benchmarking with actual like policies where we have some credible variation as opposed to just correlations which we didn't want to do um, it does appear that the educational impacts uh, are bigger than the test score impacts so real quick because I'm out of time um, you might say okay we have estimates we have bias in studies and I'll just blast through this and then you can ask me so Long story short, if you worry that individual studies are actually subject to bias, um, there are ways we can maybe account for this. Uh, you don't have to worry about this when you have experiments, but you do worry about this when you have quasi-experiments. So the best thing we can do is you can say, well, we know from other studies that uh, bias tends to be bigger um, in weakly identified studies. So we can say, well, do we find bigger effects when we, do we find different effects when we focus only on studies that are well identified with strong first stages? And it's the same. We can say, okay, well, it turns out that using the same logic mathematically, you can figure out that the marginal effect is going to tend to be more biased when you have smaller spending changes. Again, we can basically, I already mentioned that, that's sm larger versus smaller spending changes, the marginal effect is the same, it doesn't really affect anything. You may worry that, well, okay, well, some policies that you're talking about were voluntary and some of them were involuntary. So like if a district decides they're going to start increasing school spending, maybe they did a whole bunch of other stuff that also generates positive outcomes. So you might think if that's the case, you're going to find more bias for voluntary policies versus those that are relatively involuntary, like a state changing the parameters on you. And we don't really find any, any evidence of that. Um, we also may worry, well, you know, you, so you talked about the fact that you only included studies that could rule out that uh, there was a lot of selection. So maybe it's the case that if you have a study that's underpowered, it's underpowered to find effects, but it's also underpowered to find violations of the identification strategy itself. So we can look only at the well-powered studies, and again, the effects are pretty much the same. So across all these tests, we don't find any evidence of that. Um, last one here we do is say, okay, well, suppose we just plot the effect on the outcomes. So this is not the marginal effect, but the overall effect. The change in the outcome associated with the policy against the change in the outcome associated, sorry, the change in spending associated with the policy. So the slope of this line basically tells us how much outcomes change for a given change in spending. This is using a very different identifying assumption as just taking the average of the marginal effects. But it turns out if you run this regression, the predicted change in outcomes when school spending changes by zero goes through the origin, which is to say we cannot reject that when there's no change in spending, there is basically no change in outcomes as well. So there's no perfect test of this, but this is another test. Finally, uh, you may worry about publication bias. Uh, we basically look at the distribution of t-tests to see if there's uh, bias against publishing studies that are not significant. We don't really find any, any evidence of that. And we applied the Andrews and Casey adjustment for that. We look for differences between studies that are published versus those that are not published. Um, we look at differences for studies that are published in more selective journals versus less selective. We don't really find any evidence of differences there. 
Um, the one thing that I did mention is that we do find some evidence of uh, some missingness of really imprecise negative estimates. So we do uh, a few different adjustments that I can talk about later to account for that. But we do all the adjustments that people talk about. Um, one is trim and fill. Uh, the other one is called P's. And the other one is just chopping off half the data and looking at the most precise set of studies. And across all the different ways we could have accounted for publication bias, the estimates don't really change very much. And again, I sort of told you part of the reason for that is our main estimate is already precision weighted, which already guards against this kind of publication bias to a large extent. Finally, this is just showing you a bunch of different estimates that come from a variety of different assumptions we could have made about different things and a variety of different, uh, different uh, samples. So I won't go through all of these because I don't have time, but you can see this is pretty flat and these bars all overlap. So it doesn't look like there's really much going on there. So I'm not saying that ours is perfect, but this one's pretty close, that one's pretty close, this one's pretty close. So we're relatively confident what we're showing you is a reasonable description of what the world looks like. Um, this is basically the benchmarking thing I've mentioned before, so I won't go into that again. So you know, our interpretation is that looking at the effects of school spending on test scores may miss a lot of information, and it matters. Um, studies are a lot more similar than you might expect. And I think under some reasonable distributional assumptions, you can actually start to make some relatively precise policy predictions about the kinds of things that we can see and start to make sense of, of literatures. And also, I think, make statements to policymakers about the kinds of things um, that could happen under various scenarios in a ways I think you just couldn't do if you didn't do a thorough exploration into heterogeneity. All right. So I, I think we have time for a couple of questions. And I see, so Marty had his hand up, and Dick Murnane has their hand up. And um, I, I think, uh, so. I'll jump in. Yeah. Thanks, Bo. That was great. Uh, so I was looking at the other recent systematic review of this literature that's out there, and was looking at when they look at the the contemporary studies and they try and sort of zero in on the ones that they think may have more credibility, they actually get a median estimate across them for a 10% change, not a $1,000 change, but a 10% change in spending of actually like 0.07 standard deviation. So actually a little bigger than what you get, but they interpret that result radically differently, it seems. Like they put more emphasis on the variation. You're helping us understand why that might be misleading, it seems. But at the end of the day, doesn't this come down to like, is an increase of this amount worth it? And so I guess, have you like, how can we think about a cost benefit analysis based right. on this? So that's a great question. So the first response is, it's really important that people who undergo systematic reviews understand the underlying statistics that- Yeah, I don't wanna- I don't Yeah, wanna, yeah, yeah. Wanna, so like, I, I just wanna just, just make that clear. Um, so the, in terms of whether this is big or small, it depends on the outcome, right? So I would, I would argue that, you know, if you look at the educational attainment effects, which I already showed you are sort of bigger in magnitude than the test score effects, and you do a cost benefit of that, it passes. Other studies that have looked at sort of earnings directly, I've done one, uh, Diane um, and um, Jesse have done one, they find direct effects on earnings as well and they're pretty sizable and those pass a cost benefit analysis. So my, 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 re my sense, is that uh, test scores are just not a, you know, I have a whole set of papers on that alone. You publish them. So like that, that's my reason. to So because of that, I don't necessarily think it makes sense to look at that, even if it's 7%, and say, well, that's small, therefore we shouldn't spend money. I think that's a mistake. The same way I don't think we should say, well, this teacher had a low test score value added or was an average test score value, added, therefore they're an average teacher. So that's kind of the way I would say it. So I think, so I think if you look at the, Estimates, I think, capture what we think matters. Most of the time, it, can, it, it, does, it does pass the test. OK, good. I wanted to ask you, uh, thank you. It was a great talk about really interesting work. I have an unfair question. Uh, <laughs> My favorite. But it's, it's one that you'll get asked by reporters, and you'll get asked by superintendents. That is, when you talk about particular with the test score evidence, there's a, some probability you won't get any positive yeah, effects. That's right. that's so right. what's your advice on what you do with the money in order to get the positive effects? I mean, not, not a fair question, but you'll get asked. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I, I don't know that our study is well uh, designed to answer that specific question. You know, I think one takeaway clearly is that 
it's it seems to have a larger effect in areas that we have more uh, more just disadvantaged populations. So I think the first one is it should be targeted. At the very least, we can we can say that pretty pretty decisively. Um, in terms of what you do with the money, I think that's a tricky question. Um, and the reason I think it's tricky is that you know even and I'm just sort of you, if you put on your your theory hat and you think of like firms that are maximizing output. And you see two firms that are doing very different things with their budget. In some sense, one firm is maximizing their profits doing one thing. Another firm is maximizing their profits doing another thing. And it could just be that, well, they just have different production functions. And when we compare marginals, so if you were to say, well, oh, they, you, you spent more on workers and you spent more on bicycles. And therefore, bicycles are more effective than workers. When you, when you think of it from the perspective of individual firms are making decisions under just heterogeneous context, and they're making context-specific decisions, it actually makes no sense, really, to even try to look at the effects across different settings where each one is optimizing, hopefully, and see what they did and correlate that with outcomes. I think the best thing we can do, in my opinion, is to say, well, if you want to know how to spend your money, forget, on the, forget about the school spending stuff. Just look to, the, look to research that talks about best practices. Right? We know there are interventions that improve outcomes. We know there are certain kinds of curricula that tend to improve outcomes. We know that there are kinds of school models that tend to improve things, or like ways of writing teacher contracts that tend to improve outcomes. So I would say all those things are basically telling you. I mean, all those things take money, right? So if you want to increase, you know, you, all these things that I'm describing take money. You want to you want to implement a new curriculum. Use whatever you have money you have on those best practices. But I think those two things are really kind of completely separate from the question of what the what the size of your budget is. And to be clear. It's not obvious to me that like, even when you increase the budget by $1,000, all of that is going to the most productive use. It's possible that like half of it is wasted. But half of it is still doing something, and that's what we're finding evidence of. Thank you. OK, so join me in thanking you. So as, as I mentioned at the top, this was the last official peer seminar of the semester. We will be having another seminar for those of you who are interested on May 3rd at 1230. Scott Levy will be presenting on uh, why school boards uh, matter. Um, so uh, um, we'll hopefully, Iris, we can send out an email to folks on just yeah. where that meeting is. I'm not even sure what, what if we have a room yet, but Definitely. May 3rd at 1230. Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, just a quick note as well, the fellows do have a meeting in here afterwards, so thanks to everyone, and if you would plan to move to the lobby on this, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> 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 <laughs>